Rethinking JavaScript Infrastructure. It's May 19th, 2021, and in the previous article and video, I claimed that dependency managers don't manage dependencies. Um, this post builds on the previous one, and I promise it's going to be a bit controversial. Um, I provide recommendations that I personally implemented and seen work in a large monorepo at Facebook, and the ideas are high impact, but also high effort. Let me take you on a journey of what reimagining JavaScript infrastructure could look like. To recap, here's where we are in our series. Um, the first post was dependency managers don't manage dependencies. This time we're talking about rethinking JavaScript infrastructure. And the next time we'll talk about building a JavaScript test framework and bundler, and then talk about the Jest story. And there's still a post coming up that um, is uh, untitled. So performance, performance, performance. Um, in the previous post, we established that adding many large dependencies tends to slow down install time significantly and make all operations slower for everyone globally, even if individuals only use a subset of tools in a project. We can look at this problem another way. How long does it take to get started on a project after checking out the repository or updating dependencies after rebasing? I've seen this process take minutes when it should only be seconds. Continuous integration pipelines are a concrete example of this. You may have multiple workflows that verify a different thing about your project, yet all the workflows tend to materialize the entire dependency tree. Imagine only installing the, the dependencies you actually need for each task. When we decided, uh, uh, designed Yarn workspaces, we were guided by solving issues related to organizing monorepos and keeping compatibility with Learner, Learner, another tool. While we have a neat separation of concerns across packages, we don't leverage it to improve performance. In hindsight, we made a critical mistake by underinvesting in the performance considerations and the continued growth of the JavaScript ecosystem. Yarn eventually added focused workspaces, but few people are aware of it, and the feature is rarely used. Arguably, the feature should have been the default. Yarn's node modules installation process should be per workspace and incrementally install more dependencies based on the operations executed in a repository. So let's take all of this into another direction. What would it look like if we eliminated the JavaScript dependency managers from the critical path entirely by checking dependencies into the repository and vendoring all tools as pre-compiled binaries? Not only will it speed up all repository operations, it'll also reduce the reliance on specific dependency managers. Here are the three topics that we're going to need to wrap our heads around for rethinking JavaScript infrastructure. Dev dependencies were a mistake, checking third-party product code into version control, and building zero overhead tooling. Let's get to it. Dev dependencies were a mistake. The idea of having product and infrastructure code integrated made a lot of sense early on in the Node.js and front-end ecosystem, and still makes some sense for libraries. However, for applications, as the ecosystem matured, it is becoming evident that it, this system no longer serves its purpose. And here, libraries are defined as packages that end up being published um, and consumed by other libraries or applications, and applications are defined as repositories that use something like Yarn workspaces to manage dependencies. The split between dependencies and dev dependencies, development dependencies, in the package JSON definition of an application is often arbitrary and no longer meaningful. In the past, entries in the dependencies field usually meant that the code is part of the actual production build artifact, while entries part of the dev dependencies are only used during development. Nowadays, product dependencies are usually just inputs into a complex compilation pipeline, type system, or test framework. Quite often, there is no meaningful distinction between what is part of dependencies or development dependencies, and what actually ships to production. A simple example is a front-end UI library installed in node modules. If you're deploying compiled JavaScript bundles to production, the code of your UI library is only as an input to your compilation pipeline. The UI library is compiled into a bundle that will be deployed to production, and you do not need the source code of the library in your production environment. It doesn't matter if you're listing the UI library under dependencies or dev dependencies. For applications, I propose slightly, a slightly new way of thinking about dependencies that will lead to a distinction between product and development dependencies. Everything that behaves or is used as if it was first-party code should be a product dependency. Treat it like any other code that uh, your team is writing, and don't think of node modules for product code as a magic directory. The code and type definitions for your UI library go into production dependencies, while your compiler toolchain remains a development dependency. This perspective may be completely obvious to you, 
but I encourage you to open the package.json file of a large application and you'll find some packages violating this principle. Now, let's imagine splitting dependencies and dev dependencies up into two separate folders. At the end of this process, we'll, uh, we'll end up having one smaller node modules folder with all product related code and one large node modules folder containing all of the tools that operate on the product and third party product code, which leads us directly to the next step, checking third party product code into version control. Now that we did this in, uh, the initial steps to separate product and tooling dependencies, we can go a step further and check all third party product dependencies into version control. Hold up, you say. It may sound counterintuitive as the JavaScript community spent years building infrastructure to keep node modules out of the source trees. Historically, projects will, with checked in node modules folders are, a pain, are painful to manage. However, only checking product dependencies into, repositor into the repository limits most of the downsides. Let's analyze some of the trade offs. One downside checked in node modules are too big for version control. The mitigation, mitigation is that usually the amount of product dependencies is only about 10 to 30% of the total size of the node modules folder. Product dependencies are compiled into production bundles. It is, usually, um, it is unusual for them to be more than an order of magnitude larger than the first party code, meaning that the size of this, this node modules folder should not be much larger than the first party code already is, and any repository can handle twice the amount of files that it already contains. Additionally, you can use Yarn's flat option to ensure that um, you're only using a single version of the same package, and Yarn's auto-clean uh, auto feature and a strictly managed custom exclusion list um, can be used to remove unused and unnecessary files. I recommend analyzing the current size and predicting the future growth before actually committing to this. Another downside is that the checked in node modules folder will grow to be unmanageable. The mitigation is that the difference between third-party dependencies for product and tooling code is that the former is deployed with applications as if it was first-party code. Given that this code impacts the size of an application, it is unlikely to grow by orders of magnitude or to outpace first-party code creation significantly. Further, there is an incentive for teams to reduce the size of their production bundles instead of increasing them substantially. Right? Downside. Updating um, um, checked-in node modules is painful and slows people down. The mitigation is that managing a checked-in node modules folder is painful, especially when upgrading large dependencies or large trees of, uh, of dependencies, for example, Babel and Jest, which both contain dozens of packages. However, since we're exclusively checking in product dependencies, we're unlikely to encounter, uh, encounter such tightly connected packages. Most of the time, people will only add or update a small number of third-party product dependencies. Another downside is that people may commit manual changes to node modules instead of upstreaming fixes. The mitigation is that this problem can be avoided by building a CI step that verifies the integrity of the node modules folder and prevents people from patching files directly. There are also upsides to checking in node modules. One upside is that visibility into third-party code deployed to production. There is usually little scrutiny on newly added dependencies during code reviews. Somebody may add a single line to a package.json file that can pull in hundreds of other dependencies. This problem is exacerbated and easy to miss because GitHub hides changes in yarn log files by default. When materi materializing third-party dependencies in the repository via a yarn install, changes and additions are visible to people during the code review stage. It makes people aware of large trees of the transitive de uh, dependencies that are added. If somebody adds a thousand files just to use a single utility function, it makes sense to apply more scrutiny during code review and maybe even um, recommend alternative solutions. There's another upside is uh, that um, there's a reduced dependency on individual package managers. There are many JavaScript dep dependency managers and it's unclear how they and their use will evolve in the future. Checking node modules into the repository will reduce the reliance on a single package manager and increase option value. In this case, it enables the option to switch to another package manager with less work as we eliminate yarn from the critical path and only use the output of the install operation, the node modules folder. From a previous post about principles of developer experience, and quoting, Maximizing option value is about retaining or gaining option value, which means any change to a system should unlock more options for improvements and significant future changes. There's usually little option value embedded in the design of existing systems. If we keep option value in mind when we, when we redesign infrastructure, we can naturally adapt to new requirements in the future. 
To summarize, we can mitigate many of the downsides and gain upside by taking more ownership of the dependency management process with this strategy. If you're not convinced, convinced yet, now that the product and tooling dependencies are neatly separated and product dependencies are part of version control, together with the uh, next step, everything will fall into place. Build zero overhead tooling. To get start, uh, to a state where we can immediately get started after checking out the repository or after rebasing, we need to have a fast um, access to all the tools like the bundling infrastructure, web server, test frameworks, linter, type checker, and all the other tools. Installing them as part of node modules um, of the node modules install process is slow. Concretely, it is slow to resolve dependencies and to copy tens of thousands of files from tarballs. It's also slow to start them. Many of these tools load thousands of files into memory when using them, and the solution is to pre-compile them and vendor them into your projects so that they don't require installing and running third-party dependencies from source all the time. Various tools um, are already beginning to move the ecosystem in this direction, like Dino's compile com command, and Next.js is compiling many of its dependencies to pre-compiled bundles, which already had a meaningful impact on its install times and the startup time of its um, um, tools. You can pre-compile tools in one of, one of the following ways. One, compile your JavaScript tool into a single JavaScript file, Two, use Vercel's package, package. it's called PKG, package, um, to create optimized binaries for your tool. Use Dino compile to produce binaries for tools written using Dino. And not recommended, but maybe sometimes recommended, build a custom tool chain specific to your projects. The next step will be to deploy the tool. Here's some example methodologies. One is maintain a private homebrew tab if you're using only, uh, if you're exclusively using macOS and the, the brew tool. Use node modules and JavaScript package managers. We previously established that JavaScript dependencies are, uh, dependency managers are great at downloading artifacts and putting them in place. And they work great for storing binary data and downloading them. In this case, the idea is to put binary artifacts into packages without any other dependencies. It's literally just a package JSON file and the binary artifacts and whatever is needed to run them. The third option is to build a custom system that will build packages on, you know, for example, GitHub and then downloads um, and executes them transparently. And then not recommended, but you know, maybe sometimes recommended is to check the binary artifact artif <coughs> the, the binary artifacts into your repository. I do not recommend this approach because it will negatively imp uh, impact the um, performance in your repository. It's only okay if the binary in question rarely changes like once a year. While we'll still have an install process, it is usually an order of magnitude faster than installing all the source files. The process can be hidden from the user by integrating it into the tools themselves to manage um, updates um, on their own. It's essential to version the tools with the state of the repository. A version or hash must be embedded, embedded into the repository as a commit every time the tool is changed. This way you can roll back tools by updating the version or the hash in the repository if there are issues, and navigating to older commits will use the older version of the tools instead of a possibly incompatible newer one. Not all scripts and tools need to be vendored, and only the ones that are used by a large population of developers or tools with specific uh, performance constraints. Ideally, you can separate tools that aren't vendored into a different workspace so that their dependencies will only be installed when you're using the tool. An excellent example of that is end-to-end -end testing frameworks. They usually come with many dependencies and they're very big, but only very few developers run end-to-end -end tests locally. Consider isolating these tools into a separate part of the repository and writing a script to automatically handle installing and updating its dependencies when developers invoke the tool. Currently, I'm not aware of any ready-to-use solution that unifies both the compilation and the deployment process into a smooth experience. If you're building one, please let me know. Adding it all up, with all of the above steps um, applied, a repository can be checked out or rebased, and engineers can immediately start developing inside of it. Engineers will gain more control over the code they deploy to production, spend much less time waiting to install dependencies, and benefit from a better separation of concerns. Further, because the tooling for bundling, type checking, testing, and linting are separated into different packages, they can each be improved and managed separately. A further optimization could be for JavaScript tools to share information across tools. Right now, most tools have custom configuration and code to parse, analyze, and compile JavaScript. None of them share common infrastructure, caching, or even have the ability to share the same information, which leads to many inefficiencies and incompatibilities in the JavaScript ecosystem. Why, for example, do I need to configure Babel for my bundler, 
test framework and the linter. In the future, a standard API for sharing information across tooling would be ideal. As I said in the intro, I built and deployed a system at Facebook using the ideas presented in this article series. The time from checking out a gigantic monorepo, installing dependencies, starting Metro and building JavaScript bundles was reduced from 7 minutes to 7 seconds. Half of the improvements came from ideas presented in this series so far, and the other half was achieved through bundling optimizations that we'll talk about in the future. Reimagining JavaScript infrastructure is a luxury, and not every team and project will have the resources to make step function changes like I'm proposing. I'm not here to convince you, I'm here to tell you that the JavaScript ecosystem can do much better than it has in the past. Prove me wrong, improve on my ideas, but always bet on JavaScript.